Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Veritas Forum. We're very pleased to see all of you here uh, this evening. We have uh, three very distinguished speakers uh, with us tonight, uh, speakers and scholars, and I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, the first is Dr. Sachan Devidos. Uh, he is a professor of mathematics at Williams College in Massachusetts. Uh, he holds a PhD in mathematics from the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Before joining the faculty at Williams, he was an Arnold Ross assistant professor at The Ohio State University. He has earned accolades for both his scholarship and his teaching. Uh, he has authored a textbook on computational geometry, authored a DVD lecture series on the shape of nature, and written dozens of research articles on topics ranging from origami and cartography to phylogenetics and particle collisions. In addition, he has attracted support from the National Science Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Department of Defense as well as holding visiting positions at The Ohio State University, the University of California, Berkeley, Stanford, and the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. He is an inaugural fellow of the American Mathematical Society uh, for members uh, who have made outstanding contributions to mathematics. He also has an incredible love for really good ice cream. Our second uh, speaker and guest this evening is President Morton Shapiro. Uh, president Shapiro was named the 16th president of Northwestern University on December 16th, 2008, and he began his term in September of 2009. He is professor of economics in Northwestern's uh, Judd and Marjorie Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, and he also holds appointments in Northwestern's Kellogg uh, School of Management and the School of Education and Social Policy. President Shapiro is among the nation's leading authorities on the economics of higher education, with particular expertise in the area of college finance and affordability, and also on trends in educational costs and student aid. In 2010, President Shapiro was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, one of the nation's oldest and most prestigious honor societies. President Shapiro was previously president of Williams College from 2000 to 2009, and earlier he had served as a member of the Williams College faculty from 1980 to 1991, and he was also at the University of Southern California from 1991 to 2000. President Shapiro received his bachelor's degree in economics from Hofstra University and his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. He and his wife Mimi have three children, Matt, Alyssa, and Rachel. Our third speaker and guest this evening is Dr. Uh, Dr. Axel Mueller. He is senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy here at Northwestern. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Frankfurt in Germany. He specializes in philosophy of language, American pragmatism, and general philosophy of natural science. He also has interests in Kant and history of analytic philosophy. Dr. Mueller is the author of the book Referens und Felibismus. Close enough. <laughs> uh, a study of Hilary Putnam's thought. He has published articles on the normative structures of inductive concepts and on the relations of scientific practice and realism. He is currently working on a series of articles that aim uh, at an extended analysis of the semantic basis of mental content externalism and Kant's critique of pure reason, as well as on the manuscript for a book on pragmatism to be published by Acumen Press. During 2012-2013, Mueller served as a Dodd visiting professor at the Center for European Studies at the University of Flensburg in Germany. He also enjoys being a resource for students in his function as a University Fulbright faculty advisor and fellowship and honors coordinator in the Department of Philosophy. Please join me in welcoming our three speakers tonight. As Joe mentioned, uh, all three of them are going to start with remarks. We're going to uh, begin with uh, Satyan, and then we're going to move on to President Shapiro and then uh, Dr. Mueller. How are you, my friends? Excellent, excellent. 
You know, I'd like to start by thanking all the organizers for making this possible. Um, I think it's lovely, all these things that happen behind the scenes, and we finally get the fruit of the labor to hear us talk. I hope it's good, and I hope it's fun. Thanks to uh, Axel Muir for sharing the stage with us. It's a joy. I'm looking forward to hearing more of what he has to say. And, uh, and to me, a special thanks to President Shapiro. Uh, you know, as was mentioned, Morty Shapiro was the president at Williams before he came here to be the president. And uh, in fact, he's the one who sort of signed the form that gave me a job that I have today. So uh, it's great. It's great. And thank you guys for taking the time to come here. You know, it's, uh, it's lovely to see all these people. So we're here to talk about these big questions, right? These big questions and what it means in the university setting, in a secular university, about God with a capital G, faith with a capital F. What does all this stuff mean? And, uh, and some of these big questions you might have heard before in class. You might have struggled with yourself, talked about in parents and synagogue and churches. And what is the meaning of life? What does truth with a capital T mean? Is that actually possible? Is there a God? Can we actually know that there is a God? And to me, most importantly, why are infinity scarves so popular? <laughs> Isn't it just a scar? Whatever. <laughs> and today, we're here to talk about these big ideas about truth, about faith, about reality. Now, the problem is everybody has our own perspective on what is true, on what is real. So whose notion of reality is right? Is it, is it your notion of reality that is the capital R? Is it mine? Do we compromise? What's the right way of thinking about these things? And there are actually different kinds of realities, you know? There's a reality of, uh, of Gauss Bonnet. Here's the mathematical reality. Here's what it is, the integral. Yes, exactly right. It's a math talk. I'm not sure if you guys know that. Um, <laughs> the integral of every point on a surface, the curvature of every point on a surface is equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic. That means if you take your surface, you add up every point of curvature, stretch and deform that surface in lots of different ways, the total amount of curvature is going to be fixed. That although the little curvature changes all the time, the big curvature, when you add it all up, when you integrate it, is a constant. It's an amazing thing. Some of you guys right now might be looking at this getting turned on. It's great. I'm excited <laughs> about that. Some of you might agree with Stephen Colbert when he says, the equations are the devil sentences. <laughs> So is that the kind of reality we want to talk about? Is everything going to be boiled down to some mathematical truths and what that means and to some equations we can move around? You know, there's also different kinds of realities. There's reality in physics. So here's what, um, here's what Stephen Hawking writes in his most recent book, The Grand Design. He writes, the universe does not have a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously. That means right now, every choice that you could make at this second and that I could make at this second, all of those possibilities are existing and we're only living in one slice of that reality. Is that what it is? This notion of the multiverse, is that what reality is that we can actually talk about and understand and exist in? My friends, for thousands of years, the notion of truth and reality has always been linked to this notion of a god. And today in 21st century America, reality is no longer measured by church or holy days. Belief in religion, in some sense, seems no longer relevant. It seems like a scaffolding. You know, you just need religion to hold things in place until you figure out what the truth is, and then you can take that scaffolding off. Right? It's just there until you understand what's really going on. This is best expressed by this quote by Michio Kaku who talks about and rephrases a quote by Arthur C. Clarke. He says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. So if you don't understand something and you attribute it to God, just wait. Just wait. It'll happen. We'll figure it out. And your need for God is no longer there. It's amazing that science is the new measure of reality in many ways. Black is the new white. Science is the new God. And the question is, how did we get this way? So let me just step back and try to, I just want you guys to, to see things a little bit from my perspective on how this happened. I love the Renaissance era. Right? During the time of the Renaissance, you know, art and music and math and science and literature all worked together. You know, we had faith and reason and beauty, and this resulted in paintings and cathedrals and inventions and poems. It was beautiful. And after this, a time of the Enlightenment came, around 1750. 
So the Enlightenment says the following thing, that the reason must be advocated as the primary source of authority. Look, you just cannot go around and tell me the sun is in the center of the solar system. You must prove it. You just can't say, I believe it in faith. Give me some evidence. Convince me through reason that this is true. Ideas must be tested, measured, evaluated, and not just accepted. My friends, I'm a huge fan of the Enlightenment era. I love it. It gives me a job. That's what I do as a mathematician, right? It's a major force for progress, for understanding how the world works, better cars, better medicine, better transportation, better ice cream. Everything is improved because of the Enlightenment era. But unfortunately, I think it's been taken to an extreme. So let me, let me just try to explain this. I think now we try to explain everything through science. And it's probably best explained through this quote by Bertrand Russell, mathematician and philosopher superstar. And he writes this, whatever knowledge is attainable, what must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. It is only through the eyes of science that these things are going to happen. You see, we're putting all our chips in the science bucket. Now, there's one major cause of this concept in the Enlightenment, which is this notion of a dualism. So let me give you an example of what I mean by dualism, right? So here we see what I think of in the Renaissance era. On one side, we have art and math, right, fitting together. There's faith and reason. There's religion and politics. There's the unmeasurable and the measurable. Let me just pause and say one thing about this religion and politics thing. What I mean by religion is our answers to the big questions, like who we are, how things happen. And politics is our answer to the daily questions about laws, about divorce laws, about speeding tickets. And of course, the way we think about the big picture is going to affect the way we think about our everyday stuff. So it did fit together. Now, the Enlightenment era came, and it didn't say you have to pick one or the other one. It actually says you have to pick one versus the other one. Right? On this one side, you have this art major at Northwestern, kind, elegant, artistic, and loving. Right? On this other side, versus the art major, is the math major, cold, calculating, <laughs> hard. But Sexy in their own way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you see, what I want to do is I don't want to sterilize this world. I don't want to cut the world up into pieces and say, this is the math bucket, and this is the art bucket, and this is the science bucket. See, I want to deal with everything together. I want to deal with all of the mess. I love mess. So let me just give you some examples of messy things that I love. This is Grater's ice cream. I'm not sure if you know about graders, but it started in Cincinnati, some places in Columbus. This is black raspberry chip. The chocolate chips are huge and soft. You bite into it, it doesn't hurt your teeth. It melts in your mouth because it has so much fat. It's incredible. <laughs> Here's something else that's messy that I love. Sex, dating, relationships, marriage, all of that stuff that is so hard and disgusting and yet glorious. It's this messiness of being with one another. And here's a result of sex. This is my family. <laughs> right? So let me just say, yeah, it sounds great, right? Whatever. But let me just go through this picture in a little bit. So the first thing you will notice is that my wife does not look like me. Right? She's not Indian. So already we have some problems right there. Right? One of the advice my wife would give you is, the goal of marriage in many ways is to minimize pain in life. And if you marry somebody outside your race, life is going to be more painful. Right? So that's a messy world that we have. And if you think that's tough, then we have these two on the right, the one on the left. Right? What's their identity? They're messed up. You know, what are they? You know, where are they? Are they Indian, Chinese, American, what? And if you think that's crazy, then there's that little one on my lap. So this is my girl. Blonde hair, blue eyes, my dream, dream girl. What's she going to be like? Can you imagine us as parents, these crazy nut jobs as brothers and sisters? But this, my friends, is the mess of life that I adore. I wouldn't trade any of this. Right? How do we handle all of this mess of reality? See, here's what I want. I want a model. I want a theory. I want a story that can handle the full mess of reality. That's what I want. You see, I'm ambitious. I don't want a theory of only the measurable things. I want a theory of everything to handle the big questions, such as justice, beauty, relationships, significance. I want everything. Just think about this. You know, why does Victoria's Secret not sell clothes using scientific data analysis? They have beautiful, naked women. 
Because we love physical things. Why do we go to concerts? Why do we watch sports? There's a shared experience that we can think of something that we fit into a bigger realm with other people. Why do we, why do we listen to Oprah or have friends listen to Deepak Chopra or music and mysticism? Because we thirst for something bigger. We thirst for meaning. Why do our hearts burn when we watch 12 Years a Slave or watch The Godfather or watch The Matrix when Neo goes into the metal detector and it goes off and he goes like this and filled with guns? Why? <laughs> because we want Morpheus to be set free. We want redemption. We want justice. There's something bigger in us. So which story, which model, which theory best explains all of these hungers in us? The Enlightenment viewpoint says, Everything can be understood through science alone. But my friends, I think we're dealing with issues far larger in complexity than Gauss Bonnet, than black holes, than genetics. Science can't handle it, it is too big. My friends, let me be really careful though, right? I love science. It is a wonderful tool to measure, to find patterns, to make amazing predictions. But science is just one language. You see, it is just one tool in a toolbox of truths. This is why we need others. This is why we need writers. This is why we need philosophers, theologians, musicians, artists to express, to capture, to understand the immensity and complexity of life. You know, I just want to encourage you, if you're an undergrad here at Northwestern, it is an amazing place for an education. And don't have blinders on, so your only goal is to take classes in your major. Right? This is the one chance for you to learn the tools of truth in so many different disciplines. Enjoy it. Pick the major you want. Enjoy it. Love it. Go deep in it, but also go broad in these different things. You have an amazing university to do this in. That's what you should be thinking about, not just this one tool set. My friends, science does not have a monopoly on reason and logic. Science certainly doesn't have a monopoly on truth and reality. And believing that science is the only language of truth I feel is an incredible leap of faith. It's as large a leap of faith as a belief in a god. Now, whether you realize it or not, each one of us is living life of faith in something. Here's what David Foster Wallace says in a speech. He says, there's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. You see, we must put all our chips in some bucket. And if you choose not to pick a viewpoint, that itself is a choice. There is no neutral ground. You're going to be invested in something. What are you invested in? Now, to me, there's no theory, there's no story as satisfying in explaining the world, all of the world, not just the measurable parts, as the Christian story. So let me be clear. I don't believe in the Christian faith because it gives my life meaning or it's emotionally satisfying. I'm a mathematician. I have no emotions to satisfy. You know that. <laughs> the reason I believe in physics the existence of forces and particles that I cannot see, the reason I believe in physics is because it best explains the physical world around me. It's not because physics makes me happy or gives me meaning. And the reason I believe in the Christian faith that this world is broken due to our separation from God, that this God pursued us and wants to bring us back to him, and it's seen in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, that this theory best explains my deep questions the beautiful mess that I see, and my hunger for justice and beauty in these big things. So I just want to close with, uh, with sharing why I find this faith compelling. First of all, I think, I think the Christian faith is, is not theoretical. It's not, it's not philosophical. It's not metaphysical. In a lot of ways, it's grounded in history. Right? The Judeo-Christian faith has these historical claims as to what that faith is about, about how the way God intersected this world and took care of his people. And to me, it culminates in this amazing statement about the resurrection of Christ. Now, this resurrection about this guy who died thousands of years ago, it's, it's a linchpin to this faith. You can't use the tools of science, but you can bear on it the tools of history. You can test and to see whether this claim holds. I'm convinced they do. That's why my chips are in that bucket. And unlike any system of beliefs I know of, this Judeo-Christian faith, it boldly claims that this mess, this mess that we see is built into the very heart of God. This is why God is called Emmanuel, God with us in this mess, in this pain. This mess is central to the story. Now, the death of Jesus shows that God does not accept this broken world, that pain and justice are given a solution here. Now, now many of you might think that, you know, love the, gods, the God of love and the God of wrath don't fit together at all. 
but I think they fit perfectly together, and I'll tell you why. If I have my baby girl that you saw, and if somebody's hurting that girl, there will be wrath in my heart. And I would want justice to happen, and the world set right, and her to be set right. You see, the opposite of love is not wrath. The opposite of love is indifference, if I don't care what happens to my daughter. And at the cross, I see that this God is not indifferent. He pours the wrath on his son due to his love for us. It's an amazing thing that in this death, God actually shares the responsibility with us. Blows me away. And the resurrection of Jesus, you know, this resurrection, it's not a spiritual ghost of a resurrection, but it's a flesh and blood resurrection, which means it says that the physical world matters. Flesh matters, sex matters, ice cream matters, earth matters. This beautiful world will not be tossed aside. So what does this afterlife, this new heaven and the new earth look like to me? It, it looks like this. It looks like artists and musicians hanging out about inventors, academics, people who make more amazing ice cream, fashion designers, shoes that are better than these. It's all of these things put together. It's going to be an amazing world full of excitement. It's not about doing good deeds to get to heaven to sing songs to a magical god. Oh my goodness, dear Lord, no way. But it is a beautiful world that will be set right. It is this world that will be redeemed and set right. It is the way the world should be. And when I practice this Christian faith, it frees me. It frees me from brokenness, offers me a sense of true acceptance. And I see actually in my life more forgiveness, more peace, more love, more understanding, a wisdom to live life well. So I've said enough. Let me just close with a quote that I love. This is a quote from one of my favorite books, The Princess Bride. And, um, and it goes like this, life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, there are no quick answers. There's nothing that we as friends and colleagues at this stage are going to say that, uh, that's going to make your life easy, that's going to make a clear slam dunk case for anything. But I encourage you to just listen to us, to think about it, to wrestle with it yourselves, to talk to one another. And don't be afraid to get messy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sacha. Our next speaker this evening will be President Shapiro. Testing. Can you hear me? Because I have a lot of things, electronics. I have my cell phone. I have this mic. I have that mic. I have my jawbone, and I don't want to get electrocuted. I was afraid from the water. So uh, my job is really to react to Sachin. And first of all, I, I'm glad I, I hired you. And did you get tenure when I was president? Or? Well, a little shout out for that, buddy. <laughs> Come on. Um, anyway, I, I, I love listening to you, and I, I, I really learned a lot. Uh, three things came to mind, because I, I think Axel his job and my job was to react to what you said. I don't think we were supposed to come up with anything original. I haven't come up with anything original in about 20 years, so <laughs> trust me, it's not going to happen tonight. Uh, three quick thoughts. The first one, a week ago today, I was in Israel. My, my, my wife Mimi's there. We had uh, two of our children, my mother-in-law, 88 years old, and with a whole bunch of friends and administrators from uh, Northwestern. We had a large group, and as I told you at, um, at dinner, you know, I, I've been going to Israel for many, many years, right? And um, I don't usually do the Christian, you know, the Stations of the Cross and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and, and things, unless I'm with Christians for whom, who had never been there before. And I knew it would be meaningful. So we were there, uh, we were in Jerusalem a week ago, Saturday. And, you know, a couple of people, Patricia Teasurvin, some of you know, Vice President for Student Affairs, and Al Cubbage, Vice President for Public Information, a couple of others, very serious Christians of faith. So we went with them, actually, and uh, to see them in their eyes when they were there in uh, Calvary, and they're there in uh, the Christ's tomb, and then the slab where they put them after they took them off, and to see the tears and to see the devotion and the faith, you know, brought me to tears. You know, and uh, I would be honored to be there with you and your dad one day. So that was the first thing that came to mind is that uh, one of the things I love about Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is that uh, 
there's something for everyone. If there are any uh, Muslims there, you know, you go to the Dome of the Rock, and obviously for Christians and for Jews, there, there's no place like the Holy Land. And uh, it's something we should all pray for. Trust me, we should all pray for. So that was the first thing. The second thing, I, I was thinking, one thing I always liked about you was in addition to being a great scholar and a teacher, you're a person of faith. And I've always felt really comfortable with people of faith, whether they're Jews, observant Jews as I am, or any other faith. And, and I, I still believe that. I, I actually do have friends who, uh, you know, for, for whom faith has no role in their life and in their identity, very unlike myself. But, you know, but I've always felt there's sort of a comfort uh, about that. And in the beginning, I sort of fell in to the sort of trap that if you're of faith, then you're naturally attracted to anybody of faith. I don't know if any of you ever think about that. And that it's sort of easy because you, know, you believe in certain things that, that are very common. And I think later, Bill, we're going to talk about universal truths. And I think Axel might talk about that as well. Um, but it wasn't until I actually got here five years ago. And I got here five years ago. And one of the first things I did was I organized a lunch with local clergy. And Michael, you weren't there yet, but Tim, you were there, our, our chaplain. I, I, and you know, we had people, you know, Catholic priests and, and Protestant ministers and uh, a couple of rabbis. I don't think anyone from a Muslim faith uh, at the time. But we had a wonderful thing. And I got them all together. And I said, well, let's introduce ourselves. And you could probably guess what they did. So the first person came and they said, well, I, this is First Baptist Church. And you know, I want to tell you we have a food kitchen. And I want to tell you we volunteer. And you know, they were all talking about their public service stuff. And it was great stuff. And they all went around from there. And there were about 14 or 15 of them. And every single one talked about what Jews call tikkun olam, you know, healing the world. Just like you said, you know, healing a broken world. And it was really beautiful. And it was really inspiring. And it got to me, and I said, you know, it's kind of curious. I, you know, I, I love to hear that. I, I think as president, 16th president of Northwestern, we'd love to help you with your soup kitchens, and we'd love to help you with caring for the elderly, and uh, you know, uh, we'd love to do that. But you know, I, I brought you here to talk about God. And they were like, are you kidding me? So it was like, it, and it, it just never occurred to me that they thought that I brought them all together to talk about you know, community service as important as it is. You know, I just, I'm a person of faith. I, I just kind of felt, hey, this is good. I'm the president of America. I can get all these people together and we, we can just talk about God, you know? And, and, and then we went around the room again and it was really very interesting. Uh, and they said, wow, this is like amazing. You know, how did you ever get to be president of a secular university? Did you tell them, you know? <laughs> you, know you know, and I said, well, I don't know, you know. I, they know I observe Shabbat, you know. Where do I go, you know? I mean, I go to Shul every week, you know, and I keep kosher. <laughs> they, they, I, I guess they knew certain kinds of things, but I, maybe they didn't know. I didn't feel like I, it was a deep, dark secret I needed to tell the board of trustees and the faculty on the search committee at Northwestern that I'm a person of faith. But, you know, we went around, and that was really interesting. But then I got challenged in a really wonderful way. There was one person, I won't tell you which uh, Christian faith. And he, and he said to me, you know, this is a really shocking conversation. I'm really shocked to be here at Northwestern and talk about God and to have a president of this great secular university saying it's the most important thing that defines him as a human being. You know, and, and I really love that. I really respect you. But I think the conversation's too simple as many interfaith conversations are. Because you just talk about, well, we all believe in some version of the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule and all the easy kinds of things. So he said, you know, because that's all true, but I have to tell you, Mort, I have to tell you that in my heart, you do, uh, he said, I have to tell you that, you know, as someone really of faith, not just somebody who talks about faith, I have to tell you, you have the wrong faith. And he went on to say, it sounds funny, and he said something. He said, because you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in my faith, and I believe to my heart and soul that when you die, you're going to go to hell. And I paused. I was a little taken back. And I said, well, that's a kind of an interesting thing to say. And then, you know, it was really the first time I started thinking that, you know what? I think you're wrong, too. <laughs> you know? And, you know, and, and that's the thing about interfaith, right? You know, when you really... If you're just a little bit of faith, and if you believe in God, and you're a good person, well, I don't, I'm past that. You know? I'm an observant Jew, and I love you, and I really do, and I respect what you say, and I love the ending. But you know, 
yeah, it's not my faith. And, and it, so that's the interesting thing when I listen to you. And, and it really opened my eyes, because when I told Mimi that, she was first like, oh my God, is that what he really said? And some people went, ooh, ooh. But at the end of the day, I had to say, I agree with him. You know, I don't necessarily think he's going to hell, but you know, I don't believe the Messiah is coming. That's an important difference, duh, right? So, um, so that's something that I think about. And when I, as much as I loved what you said at the end, you know, it's, it's not my face. And, and the last thing I want to quickly say is that, um, you know, it's Pesach, it's Passover coming on Monday and Tuesday of next week. And uh, we'll have seders for 64 each night in the president's house. I don't know if any of you are coming. It, it, it tends to be more than half, actually, non-Jewish who come to our house. And I tell the whole story, and we do the whole seder, if anybody's ever been to a seder. And, you know, obviously you tell the story of the Exodus, right, from the Hebrew Bible of the Jewish slaves from Egypt. And, um, you, 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 you know, you tell the whole story. And one of the things I just love about Exodus is when Moses, you know the whole story of Moses, played by Charles and Hesse. First of all, Steve Colbert's class of 86, so go easy on Steve there. And then secondly, uh, Charles Hesse's class of 45, and he played Moses, so there. Uh, anyway, so, you know, there, there's a thing, and it's in the movie too, Yul Brenner, the whole thing, Charles Hesse. You know, he's out there, and, you know, he slays the guy, you know, he's, he goes, he's in the basket from a kid, you know the whole story, right? I think almost everybody in this, in this audience is familiar with the Hebrew Bible, right? And, you know, he's wandering in the desert. He has a family. You know, this is 1300 BCE, you know, so a really long time ago. And, you know, maybe there's some science fact about it. Maybe there isn't. And that might come up later, Bill. I don't care. I really don't care if it happened or not. For me, you act as if it did. And, and I, I have zero interest in the history about did they find things, did they not. And David Opie, who's a wonderful rabbi, just, you know, did this whole thing that you should do Pesach, even if, if I'm sure Michael knows, even if it didn't exist and somebody else just wrote a thing, it might have, and, and the whole thing. Anyway, so Moses is in the desert, and he sees, the, you know, a fire, which isn't unusual, of course, in a, the heat of a desert, right? So he's there, and he, and he sees it, and, and he's, you know, he doesn't make a big thing, but he sees that the bush is not consumed by the flame. It's the burning bush. And he walks up to it, and he hears Moses, Moses, the voice of God. And, you know, that's a moment where, you know, I think about that a lot. And I think about it, maybe not in the context of that all of a sudden you hear voices and, and God speaks to you or anything. But I think of a wonderful expression that in Hebrew is dalif ne Med, which means know before whom you stand. And in many synagogues over the, the ark where you have the Ten Commandments, Right, and if you have ten commandments, so often on top, and you have the, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, and and it, and it says that Dalif name me know before whom you stand, and that's something I tell people all the time, and, and I, I say to ask that question, you know, who do you before whom you stand, and I think some people, you know, it's God and their faith, and other ones is trying to be a good person, and it's their grandmother, or it's their second grade teacher, or it's their you know little league coach or something, but I, I think that's a question that really does transcend whether you have a faith or whether which faith it is. But I think everyone stands before someone. And just as you said, Satya, and so beautifully, you, know, you make decisions and you're trying to be grounded and you try to do the right thing. But I always think about that. And you know, for I think many people in this crowd, it's God, it's Jesus. For me, it's God, a different God than yours, but it's God. And, and then for people who don't have you know, faith, and there's other ways they could survive and thrive and be happy and be good people. It's somebody else in their life. So I, I, I always think about that, that, and I tell my students, regardless of faith, when we have these kinds of discussions, that always think about when you're making the key decisions in your life, you know, who is it looking over your shoulder? And for me, it's my mother, it's my maternal grandfather, and it's God. So it's a little different. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Axel Mueller. Yeah, um, unfortunately, now I have um, uh, prepared something. <laughs> so um, I hope it's not going to be uh, uh, too long. And um, uh, yeah, I'm uh, the um, often mentioned <laughs> person uh, who is, uh, I'm just, um, incapable of uh, 
adhering to any faith because I'm incompetent, because I was raised without any notion of uh, religion. So, and I never felt any need for it, um, but I never felt uh, bad for it either. So, uh, I just, um, but I uh, agree with uh, Satyan's uh, feeling. I love the mess in the world and I love complexity. And I think um, uh, dealing with complexity is one of the most uh, challenging tasks uh, from the environment, from uh, many other things. And dealing with diversity and plurality in society is also uh, one part of that. And for me, um, somehow that's all of a piece. Um, and that piece I call, for lack of a better word, uh, nature. Um, and um, all those messy things, for me, are part of nature. And um, I was announced as a naturalistic um, person, <laughs> whatever. Um, and um, <laughs> this, I want to clarify from the beginning before I begin to uh, read a couple of notes that I have. Um, I'm, uh, when I speak of nature, I take the whole shebang, uh, including uh, human behavior, its complexity, human judgment, and so on and so forth, which for me are aspects of uh, the natural existence uh, of the evolved species human being with the uh, intellectual and other tools uh, that we have acquired in this long process of development. So, uh, yeah, mess is great, um, uh, but uh, uh, mess is not always good to us, uh, so we try to deal with it. Um, um, we were asked uh, three questions in this, um, oh, uh, uh, in this, to answer three questions in this forum, and the third, question was uh, what I personally regard as the ultimate source of truth and why. And I think it's a good thing to begin with that, um, uh, continuing what I said already, uh, because um, it's a little bit different uh, from uh, what uh, uh, Morty and uh, Satyan have uh, said. Um, I want to use that as uh, kind of like giving you the lowdown of what I will have to say and also a little bit indicating what I can't say uh, because of time, not because I uh, wouldn't blabber um, uh, on. So um, I think there are uh, simply overwhelmingly good arguments for the view that our only source of truth is the cooperative search for the truth in all the varieties of an open-ended public process of learning from experience and from others and learning that the variety of domains requires in which we uh, need to find cognitive responses. <clears throat> there is, to my mind, no one method that fits all those domains, and I am skeptical about re reductionist promises from the point of view of, uh, of a philosopher of science and methodologist uh, that say all the science is either reducible to physics or else it's not science. I think that's just... Uh, not defensible. Um, I also don't believe in the separability of facts and values in empirical knowledge. Uh, here is an example. Uh, every finite set of data is compatible with many different explanatory theories, and selecting among them requires, because all the facts are already in, uh, it can't be done by the facts themselves, so it requires judgments that are guided by standards, norms, and agreed to plausibility measures, and error uh, theories and so on and so forth. So uh, doing good science means engaging in and negotiating norms um, as well. It's not just uh, uh, reducing uh, everything to causes uh, or something like that. Science is itself eminently human and normative, and this includes the natural sciences. In spite of my methodological pluralism, I believe there are common norms that all empirical science follows follow when they have a legitimate claim to objectivity. The pursuit of truth guided by these norms is the job of all the academic endeavors at a university if the results of these endeavors can have a claim on everyone. So that's the point here, universality. 
no matter what else they may believe, what religion they happen to adhere to, what attitudes to the results they might f may find agreeable, because we may find out things that we actually would like to be otherwise. Um, and that this liking to be otherwise is not a sufficient reason to start a new research program um, <clears throat> goes without saying. The neutrality with regard to the latter attitudes is, as far as I can see, an internal consequence of the conditions under which we can rationally expect our learning processes to be tracking the truth and the truth alone, and thereby to enable us to get a grip on the facts. Now, when I say neutrality, I know that uh, Satyan was skeptical or at least uh, uh, hesitant about this. This is what I mean. This neutrality is ensured in the following way. Our best procedures or methods to attain factual truths and to keep tracking truths wherever we need the information and knowledge afforded by them to solve the problems we sense are themselves, these methods are themselves subject to constant improvement, revision, and adaptation to new subject matters uh, and mistaken wrong starts, false priorities, and so on and so forth. So in other words, we uh, get rid of bias. Um, the norms of inquiry, they realize, and these are the four norms that all empirical scientists that can call themselves that I think uh, must realize they're self-correcting, open-ended, information-sensitive, and argument-based learning processes from experience in publicly accessible environs. Um, and I believe that science is, as it were, the same thing as normal learning processes that we go through and that are, that are indispensable for anything that we do, just on steroids. Uh, so it's learning as we know it, just on steroids. And what are these steroids? Well, these steroids are called reason in some um, uh, philosophical uh, worldviews. I would call it method or methodical, uh, regulated, self-controlled um, research. So, and the one thing that is extremely important about science is that it is self-correcting, because that is crucial for our appreciation of science as, uh, I would call it, an objectivity tool. It means that if there is evidence that science does not do what it is supposed to do in a domain, track the truth, issue information, allow us to predict, control, and explain the phenomena in this domain, if it licenses us suddenly to believe things that turn out to be unsupported by the available reasons or turn out to be false, so if, if scientific methods do all this and uh, they mislead us, then science is to be, by its own standards, self-critical. Um, so I said before that the only source of truth are the multifarious learning processes we are subject to when we respond to information coming to us while we interact with others and the world. As opposed to natural learning processes, science is simply a conscious and methodical self-controlled exercise of critical intelligence, but otherwise not different in kind. Science is thus best understood as the disciplined exercise of the same abilities that occur in natural learning processes. This is why we trust the results of science when it is well done, even more than our own learning uh, processes as they naturally occur to us. When we don't know from the point of view of our own natural learning processes, we turn to the scientists as uh, helping us out, uh, giving us a hand, giving us authoritative information about things we need to know the facts about. As long as other methods of fixing beliefs don't measure up to the same critical standards of learning from experience and the integration of all relevant evidence and consideration of alternatives, the results simply deserve less trust. I'm not saying that they're ruled out, but they're not automatically trustworthy, as it were. If the pursuit of empirical knowledge is our aim, as well as with all other purposes we have, only the best is good enough. And this is what gives science its authority. Now, I want to speak to the question of, uh, is there an objective truth? Because uh, uncharacteristically for a philosopher, maybe, I believe there is. Um, uh, 
And I believe there is such a thing even not only um, for uh, the theoretical realm, but I also believe that there, are, there is some th such thing as what I would call unconditional oughts. Uh, I can't argue this uh, too much time. Um, uh, no, it's, that's the only reason. I mean, otherwise, I would tell you. But, um, uh, so unconditional oughts may be what was previously indicated by Morty as uh, what we find. So like in these trivial discussions, you know, like where everybody shares, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't kill. Yeah, right, that kind of sounds right. Um, and uh, uh, stealing is wrong, too, and uh, a couple of other things. Cruelty is bad. Um, those things, I think there is, that we can make very good arguments that are exactly parallel to the scientific examination of claims regarding facts. Um, so that we can claim, can we, that we can see that we exercise the same learning capabilities with regard to finding out whether or not there is a fact of the matter about certain moral judgments that we have. It can turn out there isn't because uh, we can't bring enough reasons, um, but it can turn out there might. Um, or for all we know, there is. So I believe. Um, Objectivity is ill understood if it's restricted to, say, the statement of uh, physical truths, as I already said. Objectivity. My working definition of the objectivity in this context is that a belief that something is true, of which we have reason to accept, it is objectively justified when no matter which perspective we occupy, no relevant reasons against the belief tip the balance in its disfavor. Objective justification is thus predicated on perspective independence or the absence of bias. That does not mean that we could access the belief, as it were, out of the void or in detachment from what else we believe or what idiosyncratic reasons may have led us up to the belief. Uh, yes, the scores of uh, stories about scientists who dream up theories or who uh, on a jo are jogging on the uh, beach and uh, see a wave and suddenly an analogy, make, analogy makes it click. So all this is how we get to the belief. Uh, what leads us up to the belief, biographical reasons as it were. What the absence of bias means is that these particularities of perspective don't play a relevant role in warranting the assertion of the result as fact. This is what is meant when we say that scientifically established results are neutral between particular backgrounds of belief. The facts discerned in objectivity conferring justification practices thus matter to everyone equally. The results of scientific inquiry are geared to informing us that something is so and not else, no matter what else we may happen to believe. This hints at another con connotation of objective that I want to stress, namely that objectively justified assertions are presumed to be true independent of our will, just like their subject matters are so independent of our will. Now, there is an interesting relationship between truth and objectivity, um, but I think uh, I'm going to skip that uh, part. <laughs> Because uh, that's very technical. I think I have, uh, have said already enough about uh, truth and objectivity. Um, but one question that everybody asks and that all of us have been asking is also something that the methodologist is interested in, namely, uh, given that we know more or less what truth is, namely, it has to do something with be things we think being so in the world. Uh, then it's true. Uh, how do we know? Now, that's exactly where objectivity comes into play. We are entitled to regard a hypothesis as true for all we know when the reasons favoring accepting it outweigh the reasons favoring alternatives that are incompatible with it. Each of the hypotheses is a truth candidate, and scientific inquiry is the process by which we methodically and critically select among them the one we ought to place our bets on 
in light of what we know. Such a procedure, and that's the point, is only reliable when we use everything we can get our hands on that could be relevant to evaluating the hypothesis set. Information that supports as well as information that weakens our confidence for our pet hypothesis in light of the alternatives. This is how we minimize bias, as it were, on a daily basis uh, doing science, uh, considering all the relevant information. Objectivity in the sense of impartiality is thus the norm that enables regarding the process of inquiry as, as truth conducive and hence fact providing as possible. And having said this, we can see another crucial connection, the connection between objectivity and publicity. That will allow me then to uh, come to the relationship between religion and science as I uh, reconstructed here. For the same reason that we disregard the origin of evidentially relevant information, we have to maximize the audience involved in inquiry. This means that all the information needs to be accessible to everyone equally, but above all, it means that given that this is so, everything provided to the information pool is, as everyone else has access to it, equally subject to universal scrutiny. Here we have universal again. Now, it's universal entitlement to critically examine any whatever belief that is put out there um, uh, to be uh, reflected upon. Knowledge not only needs to be public, it also needs to be shared by allowing everyone to examine whether it survives their critical objections. Objectivity put into practice means unrestricted critical public scrutiny of beliefs in light of any objections coming forward from experience alternatives, or from other people. No one entering the sphere of knowledge claims can exempt their claims from scrutiny when relevant information is available that favors a contrary hypothesis. Whatever survives this process of public scrutiny, and only it, is what I would call a mandatory assertion or belief. If so, and science has the authority as described, this feeds the information to all of us as established knowledge. By the same token, it also, and that's something that connects publicity and the normativity of science with the normativity of our everyday lives in a free society. It feeds the information to all of us as established knowledge uh, and puts everyone, including the lay public, in the same position as the scientists, namely to be entitled, maybe not capable, but to be entitled to criticize a claim when and only insofar as one has relevant information that has not been contemplated in the relevant research program. Typical case is um, an implementation, okay, implementation of a model that was uh, developed by the best scientists in the world, all Nobel Prize winners and so on and so forth, and they say, okay, yeah, we are going to solve the problems of the economy with that, see. Uh, and then, turns out, bubble, explodes, crisis, everything goes wrong. Um, now, what goes wrong is not necessarily what the economists didn't know. Maybe the economists didn't know, or some economists knew. Well, what was wrong is the prediction of prosperity. And the prediction of prosperity, prosperity is checked by the misery of the people to whom that model was applied. So that's how people contest and can contest science when and only when they have the relevant uh, reasons. Um, One other thing that I wanted to say is that in light of the fact of the public learning processes which I'm describing science as characteristic of it, it is in this sense the epitome of an egalitarian and free democratic organization of people around a common goal, namely the search for truth, which is important because we need facts for any whatever purpose that we want to uh, uh, realize. Now, uh, the reference to the publicity constraint allows me to turn to the question of the relationship between scientifically established facts and religious belief of faith-based knowledge claims. And here is probably where we most differ 
in our point of view. Um, when we contrast, but actually maybe not. Um, I mean, I didn't feel, um, at least with what Morty said, I, that I would uh, disagree uh, in principle. Uh, when we contrast faith and knowledge, what is meant is usually that faith in one way or another constitutes what religious scientist Joseph Bishop calls a doxastic venture. Now that's one of those fancy philosophical terms they wanted to use. Doxastic venture an often conscious decision to adopt or hold on to a belief in spite of available evidence or without evidence. And sometimes this serves the function, a very important function sometimes for certain projects, of enabling acting towards an uncertain future as taking up what William James called a credit of belief. One adopts a perspective, takes a stand, ventures a belief, and dependent on this venture acts as if what the belief says were the case. <clears throat> now, if one remains there, then it's just wishful thinking. <laughs> That's what the scientist says. If this contrast between faith and scientific results captures some of the reality of faith, and uh, as I said, I wouldn't be able to tell, but I hope, then it is clear that faith-based assertions enjoy a different standing from assertions issued in the scientific process. While the individual undertaking the venture may be permitted to rationally adopt the belief if it doesn't conflict with any scientifically established results, and while the venture and action pursued in it may entail the assumption that what is posited is a fact, the belief is treated analogous to a truth claim, the entitlement to the belief is markedly different. As a venture, the belief is not adopted because it has withstood public criticism, and insofar as one holds on to it, no matter what, is also held immune to public criticism. It is also in light of the diversity of religious perspectives into which it potentially cannot be integ integrated, and of the presence of non-theistic, a-religious members of the audience of justification. Um, uh, it's not prima facie uh, universalizable. So um, the problem for uh, uh, religious beliefs, as it were, might not actually be a problem because it could be just the decision to privately follow a precept uh, and not let it interfere with um, public, uh, as it were, uh, affairs. Um, that's, uh, I have a couple of things about interreligious relations to say too, although I'm totally incompetent, as I said, because uh, uh, probably um, I haven't had, well, I've, uh, I've had a couple of them. But the fact is, I think if we ask what the university should do is, uh, let me put it like this, in the words of a revered philosopher of science that I like very much, Elliot Sober, who said, uh, the university should also be a place for theology among consenting assault, ad adults. And I think that's fine. <laughs> Uh, I think that we'd like to open this up by just asking if each of you wanted to ask a question of one of the other presenters, uh, sort of in response to their initial remarks. So maybe I'll, I'll go first, because I haven't spoken in a while. Um, <laughs> first guy to go. So uh, I just had a question for Morty, which really, I thought what you said was really beautiful. There's only one thing you said that kind of tipped me back a little bit, and I thought it will be wonderful if you can explain it. Uh, when you said it... One of the things that excites me about the Judeo-Christian faith is I believe that these things are historical in, in some sense that God really did act in history this yeah. way and the way that uh, in some sense I can turn to God and the way he could act in the world today is because there's this past evidence. And you maybe had made a quick comment about it might not even matter. Right? And I think, Alex, you sort of mentioned this too about, uh, about this. Um, so could you say a little bit about uh, the might not matter part? Sure. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. My mic's on, right? So... Um, you know, a lot of my friends who don't have a strong religious faith try to trip me up on this stuff. You know, what's the evidence that, you know, 3,300 years ago, 2 million Jews 
you know, schlepped across the desert and, you know, crossed the Red Sea and the whole thing, or what's the, you know, and, and it's like, it's very funny because as some of you know, I see some of my students in the, in the audience, I do empirical economics, I do applied econometrics. You know, what I do for a living as a teacher and as a scholar is I set up hypotheses, they're all falsifiable, okay? <laughs> So Karl Popper and, you know, would be very happy with me, as you would. And, and, you know, I apply statistical techniques to see what's true and what's not true. And that's what I do. That's what I teach, econometrics. That's what I publish. And, and you know, that's it. But, you know, I, I don't feel like I need to take that into my religious life. Hmm. I don't feel like I need to set up hypotheses that could be refutable. I just feel like... My faith is what defines me, and I'm happy with my teaching, and I'm happy with my publishing, but I don't really feel, and this is something I really learned from our friend Peter Lipton, who actually is a great philosopher of science at Cambridge, passed away tragically, used to teach at Williams. And um, you know, one thing I learned from Peter is that you don't have to be consistent. And I, and I think that as students in the audience, you think you have to have some framework for, and, now, and it has to be true in love and, and in faith and, and in everything. It doesn't. It doesn't. I don't feel like a compelling need to apply the falsifiable you know, metrics of my profession hmm. on my religious life. And yeah, I, I think it's true. But if it's not true, you know, I, I know one of the things, Bill, you said, what would shake your confidence in your faith? And I've been thinking about that, nothing. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, it just wouldn't. And I, I don't, I, I, you might think, well, if the Messiah came back, I don't know. I, I just can't picture anything refuting my faith. It's so important part of my, my identity. Mm. And I, I'm just not really interested in this historical, you know, evidence about where David fought Goliath. I just, you know, I accept it uncritically, and I don't feel like I need to prove it to anyone or anyone needs it to prove to me. I don't, I, what do you think about that? Are you, do you feel the same way? Because we're, you know, our professions, we're yeah. not philosophers, yeah, and, and right. you know, but philosophers too. You set up things and you refute them, especially philosophers sure. of science, but people who do the kind of empirical stuff that I do and you do, yeah, right. you know, we, do we have to apply those same, that's my question for you. Do we have to apply <laughs> the same standards that we do in our teaching and in our research to our faith? You know, to me, what, that's a great question. I think w I have to pick between these different faiths, right? As you're saying, at the end of the day, we might agree on a lot of things, but then you have to say, wait, that's not what I'm gonna buy, right? So yeah. there are these choices that we're all making. And, uh, and why do I have to pick one choice over the other? So in some, I mean, I was born in South India. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a history of the Christian faith in my life, but at the same time, I'm surrounded by a culture that very much isn't. And I came mm -hmm. to America and I grew up, you know, in a weird way. Uh, it's a long story. But, uh, but roughly the idea is I have a choice, right? It's, it's not that uh, Christianity is the default that I have to pick. And, and what attracts me to the Judeo-Christian faith is these kind of measurable things. And so it is important, to me, it is important that, uh, that if I am making an amazing stance that this God is actually alive and real, and as he sort of redeemed and saved the nation of Israel, he will one day redeem me and my friends and will continue to do so. I need to make sure that happened before I put my chips on the bucket to say it might happen now or it happens in my life today and things like that. So it, it is important to me. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mueller? Um, yeah. Um, you speak about... Uh, and that's also my question, because I, I had the same question as uh, Morty, because as Morty explains his stance um, on faith, um, I think that's something that we, we can uh, realize. Another question on the uh, paper was, uh, like, what's the right interreligious relationship? Is it relativism and so on? And I believe, yeah, the answer is yes, uh, because what Morty said is, well, it's not by the same standards as publicly establishable truth that I say it's true for me, right? And I decide it's true for me. And that's a relativist stance that someone can take to comp compartmentalize claims and restrict those claims also, uh, I mean, before at dinner we talked about proselytizing and so on and so forth. You don't wanna like 
uh, dominate someone with your faith or something like that. It's a private matter. It's, it's something that is important for um, guidance or what have you, or uh, taking a stance in the as if. I think that's something that I can understand, and that's uh, something where I would apply the word choice mm. um, more comfortably than when it comes to kind of like a double standard. And that's something that I, as a philosopher, don't like. So can I push you uh, on that just a so little bit? So the double standard is this. Yeah. On the one hand, um, you say you want to believe these things as a truth in the sense of science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, then you withdraw them from scrutiny and uh, right. a critical examination from the need to support certain really scandalous things like resurrection and so on. I mean, we have absolutely no reason to believe uh, at all that these things miracles, et cetera, et cetera, um, in any continuation of uh, the knowledge about matters of fact could have been factual. They defy natural laws. So um, I don't think that uh, you can, that that's really is not up to you uh, whether that's true or not. Um, let me put it this way. You're a mathematician. I, I know little math, so two plus two equals four. That's, I know that. Um, now, if th that's a mathematical truth. Now, if God made two universes on Monday and he made two universes on Tuesday, God cannot make it false that he has four universes on Tuesday evening. That follows from math not from God's will. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, it follows from all the knowledge we have that certain things that you regard as factual are not exemptable from, um, yeah, just the ordinary evidential ways, if you want to assert them in the way yeah. that science, scientific claims are found. So, so I see there are a double standard that I uh, would criticize and that I would not see legitimate or legitimized by, say, freedom of religion or something like that. So I'm not, I mean, can I just say, yeah, I'm not making a double standard there, or I hope that's not my point. So forget the resurrection for now. I, let's just talk about just miracles. It, it feels like you're kind of getting to that point a little bit, right? Can, mm. can anything happen outside of sort of the physical laws that we know and understand? And you're saying that you believe they can't. Is that, is that right? Well, it's not merely a belief. I mean, I have uh, an enormous, uh, well, I, I, I mean, just explained yeah. why, what, what stands behind the trust in science as opposed to other methods of fixing belief. Sure. I just believe that the best is good enough, only the best is good enough, and the best method to uh, finding out about these things that we have come up with, and it will improve in the future, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And we find out things that we couldn't believe nowadays. And just think of something like this. I, I tell this to my philosophy of science students a lot. Um, someone in 1820, a little bit before that, in New York, tells their, uh, tells their mother, I'm going to talk to my girlfriend who is in San Francisco right now simultaneously, right now. And she would go like, are you nuts? That's impossible. Yeah, sure. It's impossible. We do it every day now. So this, this is going to happen. So I, I, I do believe there are things that we don't know yet. But that's not one of the Miracles are not the same kind of thing. So the reason I believe in miracles and I buy it is because and they're, in some sense, non-testable, repeatable events is because I believe they're historical acts, meaning that God is intersecting space and time to do something, namely the burning bush as an example, right? I, I think that was true. It wasn't that every bush is going to burn, but at that time, God made that bush miraculously burn. He has the power to intersect our world, the natural world, and do things. And of course, we can't measure those things because he, by definition, is outside of the tools that we have to measure. 
So those things could happen, and they're singularities, certainly, right? They're not lines that go through that are measurable all the time. And so that, that's the way I view miracles, and that's the way I view intersection of history and how God works in it. So would you, would you buy it now that he has explained Absolutely, it? yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so gentlemen, I'd like to turn uh, the theme uh, this evening, of course, is what is the role of faith at a secular university? And uh, you know, we live in a country that is exceptional, certainly in a sense that the majority of uh, Americans believe in God. Uh, that's unusual in the Western world, certainly compared to most countries in Europe. Uh, and so when you're thinking about the American university, uh, do you find that... Uh, in your experience, university is really truly uh, understanding and indeed tolerant of religious faith, or not really? Uh, do you think that students are perhaps hesitant to bring religious faith into classroom discussions? Uh, is there a chilling effect there? And, and what do you make of that? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that because they're adhering to some sort of norm? Um, what's your experience as, as university professors in, in terms of the role of faith? Want me to go yeah, first? Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I, a secular doesn't mean there's no place for any religion. It means there's, you just don't privilege one over another. And I think some schools abide by that definition more than others. And I think we had a little bit more trouble, frankly, at Williams than we do here at Northwestern. And um, I, I think this is a place where faith-based communities really thrive with the help of you know, chaplains and buildings, you know, it's a little harder in a small community, it really is. But in, in the context of a great global research university, I think that, um, you know, any, there, are, there are a lot of people at graduation, Bill, who tell me here that in addition to enhancing their aesthetic sensibilities and getting critical thinking skills and working on their writing and, and, and speaking, that they've also enhanced their religious faith. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody said that to me in 20 years at Williams College, to tell you the truth. I, I think maybe it wasn't part of the culture to admit it, mm -hmm. even though we had a lot of faculty with a strong faith, mm -hmm. and you're a perfect example of it. It wasn't, you know, the culture was that you didn't rock the boat, you know, and, and it wasn't large enough community that people could really have enough people with whom they identified in, in a faith-based sense the way it does here. Now, we had a spirited discussion at my table at, at dinner about whether religion departments you know, are too aggressively teaching the Bible as history and literature and not the way I read the Bible, uh, and whether you know, they're, it's nice to challenge belief. That's one thing you do in college. You know, but is it do professors of religion challenge too much? And we had a student at the table, who was right there in the corner, who argued that even here at Northwestern, he felt a little bit that he had to you know, abide by the professor's um, interpretation of the Bible, <clears throat> not only in religion classes, but in other classes. And whenever he went in to talk about you know, that he was a very serious Christian, you know, it was often, well, we're not talking about that. This is Northwestern. And it was interesting to hear his perspective. My reply was, you should try most other secular colleges and universities <laughs> if you think this was uh, put you on the defensive. And there's nothing wrong to put people on a defensive, but you have to do it in a way as faculty. We talked about right. you don't want to lose them. You don't want to insult them. You want to take them seriously. You want to challenge them, but in a, in a way that enhances education and doesn't stop dialogue. And one thing, one reason I'm so proud to be president of Northwestern as I think we have, we welcome that kind of dialogue here much more than uh, most secular colleges and universities. I mean, I, I just want to agree and just say you could see it just from here, right? I mean, we were having this conversation with not just faculty, which is a pretty cool thing, but the president of the university is actually making these claims, so I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, just one thing, just from a, not a president viewpoint, since I'm not one, but just from a teacher's viewpoint, is I think we have to be careful within the classroom to talk about faith to a certain degree, certainly in a math class, because you have a power structure, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's an authority figure as me as a professor who has the right over a student's grades and their careers and their letters of recommendation. So I think you, could, uh, you can be clear as to what you believe, but you have to be really careful that uh, you don't ever push that power structure in any way. But once you get to know the student outside of the classroom setting, after they've left your classroom, it'll be fun to have coffee with them. And, and I think students are really thirsty. They do want to come and 
get to know you as a person and to learn about your ideas, right? Because you're an adult and they want to they want to figure it out. Yeah, I, th I think um, I um, I totally agree with what you say. Uh, the the most important thing is, of course, not to confuse, and maybe that's what the professor, even though. Uh, we also had other hypotheses at the dinner table. We did. Uh, uh, what <laughs> the professor dinner, maybe wanted to provide, and that is, I think, yeah. an absolute norm, and that is not relativistic, but it's an absolute norm, and yeah. that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, the odds, is an unforced environment for everyone, no matter what background they mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. And that is, as I just explained, uh, the precondition for uh, scientific uh, research and religious studies is scientific research into religion as well. Now, one th and, and so I totally agree with, with what Satyan said. But these things, when the door to the lab, the door to the classroom opens and so on, there's a, a strict rule of neutrality. Simply, so one thing that we avoid with the rule of neutrality that would be very detrimental is that, for example, is a majority culture. So that we uh, suddenly have people of one faith dominating those people who don't believe and those people who have other beliefs, um, only because they're in the majority. And that then carries the way which beliefs are accepted. That would be a serious detriment to the mission, to many missions of the university, civilization, civilized uh, discourse, uh, mm -hmm. Um, scientific discussion uh, and the reliability of the scientific process, all this would be in play uh, there. And as a professor, I, I try to teach students that this, yeah. all those uh, are our mission in academia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to get a response from each of the three of you, please. Uh, if there was one thing from your particular perspective that you wish the audience knew uh, about your Christian worldview or your Jewish worldview or your uh, scientific uh, secular worldview, what would that be? What would you want the audience? Uh, I'll go, I, go, I guess I'll go know. first. We'll just go this way. Um, my encouragement is uh, to get excited and read, uh, read scripture the right way. That's my encouragement. Um, I don't even mean, it uh, doesn't have to be the New Testament or anything like that. I actually encourage you to read the Hebrew scripture. It's one of the most beautiful things ever written. It's amazing. And, uh, and I think one of the dangers in the way we read scripture is that a lot of times we read it through the eyes of the Enlightenment. We read it as a scientific document. And say, here's Genesis 1. It says the sixth day you know, was when man was created. And Genesis 2 says, well, God created man first, and then he made all these other things. My goodness, there's a contradiction in the first few pages. Throw this stuff out, right? What scientific theory would even hold weight? And that's absolutely true. You read it through the eyes of the Enlightenment as a scientific document, and it is junk. Because it's not meant to be read that way. Right? There's a purpose behind this thing. So you can take one of two roles. You can say, the people, the editors who put this book together, man, they were trying desperately to make it work, and they didn't have it all together, right? So that's one approach. Or the second approach is, they really care about this faith. This is their devotion. They, the editors wonderfully put this together. And, uh, and there's a reason it's crafted that way. There's a reason Genesis 2 follows right from Genesis 1. Not that they didn't know what to do with it, but it's a purposeful thing. And, uh, and how does the life of David work out? You know, just as an encouragement, let me give you this. The last words of King David that's recorded in scriptures are basically two mafioso hits that he asks his son, King Solomon, to do. Take out these two old guys with gray hair and make sure their heads don't go to the grave without being covered in blood. And it's amazing to me that that's in scripture. And the next sentence is, and King David died. And, uh, and I love scripture because it's a very postmodern approach. Because that's probably not his very last words that he said, right? But yet the, the author chose to frame it like that to say something about David, about his character, about his desire for power, and yet his sense of humility and his sense of, it's a beautiful thing. So I just encourage you to look at the scriptures in a different light. So Chen, I'd like to follow up on one thing you just said. So if you're looking at the scriptures in a different light, not coming, for example, to them with an enlightenment perspective, so how do you understand then Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? Was there a different understanding by the authors or the people writing or reading at the time that, that oh, I see. we need to understand in order to so, in interpret those in a way that makes sense? So to me, here's the way I've, uh, I've understood it, is uh, during the time uh, that 
these narratives were being told. A uh, very common creation tale is, uh, is the Babylonian epic of this woman, Tiamat, who is the goddess of the universe, being ripped in two by her son, Marduk, and creating the heavens and the earth from those things. And uh, one thing that happens in this creation epic is that man is made as slaves for the gods to rule the earth, right? They're basically made as clay slaves. And if you read Genesis 1, it looks very much like it. You know, these beautiful things are made, and at the end, man is made, possibly could be a slave. And Genesis 2 is there, I think, as a corrective to say that this is probably what happened in real life, you know, in terms of what the order of things were from the Big Bang and on. But in Genesis 2, it modifies and says, just if you think that somehow it's an afterthought, Genesis 2 says, man, mm -hmm. all this was made for the purpose of man. God adores man so much that he's not a slave, but a steward, a representative of God on earth to bring goodness to this world. So, so I think that's a beautiful corrective at that time. Thank you. President Shapiro? You know, I, I could quickly follow on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I have friends who have almost open disdain for religion, but yet I still love them, you know, and, and I wish they would change their, their attitude, but there still could be very good people and all that. But one of the things that they sometimes bring up is that, you know, if you just believe something blindly, it sort of dulls your intellect, and it really doesn't. And I, I think there's a tremendous amount of intellectual stimulation mm. discussing the consistencies and in, in, consistencies in the Bible, and you know, it's just really is an incredible way to engage and, and, and expand your understanding of the universe. And I'll give one example. Michael Simons there who runs Hillel and does a brilliant job. And he and I were together at a sort of a Bible studies thing. Johanan Petrosky Stern is a brilliant faculty member at Northwestern in the history department. And he gave a talk you guys well would have loved because it had a lot of intellectual stimulation. It was on the Christian interpretations of the book of Esther and how the, the Christians cool. interpret it in a very different way than it was originally written. It's one of the few books you know, in the Hebrew Bible that doesn't mention God, but the Christians, it mentions God a lot. You know, it's completely, the ending, it, it, it was like, I never even thought about it. You know, I know the book of it's Purim, I know it very well, and, and everything. And, and you know, to hear him talk about how a different faith based on my faith, you know, took that mm. for, you know, its own interpretation to predict the, the rise of Jesus and, and a whole bunch of other things was absolutely, I, I haven't stopped thinking about it. And I heard a lot of good talks, uh, a brilliant economist spoke yesterday. You know, it's, I go to a lot of talks, but the one that is still haunting me is one that, you know, led to more intellectual stimulation and thinking for me than anything else. And it was, and someone was like, the Bible, does it really matter? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a real way to uh, hone your thinking, critical thinking. And uh, it's just, I, I find those issues even more fascinating than I do in my own field of, of economics. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, but I don't have a big story to tell. Um, I, um, I'm a philosopher, I only have principles. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so one of the principles that I uh, most like stems from uh, one of my most revered um, teachers, uh, Hilary Putnam, uh, and it's very simple. Nothing is clear in advance. Um, that's one thing. And uh, another motto that I recommend to anyone who is cognitively interested and excited about intellectual stimulation, about critical thinking, and so on and so forth, is another principle that um, I think uh, when we wish to claim something as a truth, but uh, we don't quite know why, and then we just plump for it somehow and hope no one discovers that it's shaky. Um, uh, I think to avoid that kind of overreach, um, one principle of another philosopher, um, J.L. Austin, that I've never forgotten since I read it first, is enough is enough, but enough is not everything. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like, in the interest of time, to turn to questions from our audience. Uh, the uh, 
Veritas website does a nice job of ranking these in terms of the number of people who are in favor of a particular question. So I'm going to start with the one that got the most marks. Uh, why can't professors be open about their faith beliefs when teaching? As long as they stay objective, uh, isn't it okay for them to be honest about their beliefs, especially when teaching about topics related to religion? No, I don't, I think they should. I mean, I don't think it, it should matter. Um, I teach a math class, so if I say I'm a Christian, I say let's integrate, you're still gonna be scared no matter what I say. <laughs> But, but if I was teaching uh, a class on history or, or faith or religion or maybe philosophy of these ideas, I think it, I would have to be honest in the sense of integrity just to say, hey, by the way, let me just be really clear. Here's where I stand. And there could be bias and a perspective on what I have. I'd love for you guys to share your thoughts with me. But, uh, but I'm going to be as clear as I can uh, and try to see it from an objective way. I think it's very dangerous to say that there is an absolute objective way of looking at anything. Right, we're all biased in some sense. It'll be nice to lay the bias at the table, and and then to go from there. You know, I just say, you know, I teach economics, and you know, when I in in my applied econometrics, I do, you know, access and affordability in college, and in the course I just did, I do income and wealth mobility and poverty and all that stuff. And I suppose I could say this is rooted in healing the world and Jewish values, but I don't feel, I mean, I don't think it has anything, any relevance. I think anybody, whether they're secular humanists or whatever they are, they understand that, you know, extreme poverty is really bad. It's probably one of those absolute truths that you said everybody yeah. would accept. So I don't feel like I need to couch it in that. I do feel, however, that we're all in positions as faculty to be role models. That's right. And the reason I do so much faith-based talking is because I'm proud of my faith, and, but I don't, do I bring it into the classroom? You know, maybe if I taught religion, I would, but I don't teach religion. I teach economics and empirical economics, but you know, I, I make that distinction between, so I, you know, it's not that I hide it in the classroom, but certainly when I'm out of the classroom, I wear it on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, same, same here. Uh, 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 I think uh, in, in the question itself, there are two very important things. I mean, as long as they remain objective, and then there is, you, I mean, I can also tell students my shoe size. I mean, this is all private matters, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, how much we disclose of our private affairs, I think, comes a little bit with the uh, atmosphere of confidence in the classroom, or how well you know the students, and so on, mm -hmm. and how little force you exercise over people who, as Satyan said, depend on them. I think that's the, the thing that we have to be most conscious of in, these, in the decision whether or not we make a, a confessional as opposed to an evidential act in the classroom, mm -hmm. is what happens to people who are much younger than you, who may respect you as an authority on everything, even though they may later learn that scientists are in no better position than anyone else to recommend certain beliefs, uh, policies, norms, and so on and so forth. Um, so we got to tread uh, carefully with that, uh, out of respect for everyone else and out of respect for our mission as uh, scientists. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question that had the, the most hits was, at what point does religious tolerance become a hindrance for important or indeed critical dialogue regarding particular faith viewpoints? Is there, is there a, a relativism that, that comes into play there? Uh, um, maybe this could be tied to something that uh, Axel was talking about earlier, where we're keeping these spheres of our faith and our lives um, in one compartment and maybe our actions in terms of politics or different things in a separate compartment, I actually don't buy that. I mean, I, I really don't buy it. I think that, uh, I think it's really hard for us to separate those two things at the end of the day, Me meaning the following thing. How do I view, let me just take a really silly example, but like how do I view divorce laws? Right, like, you know, when should somebody get divorced and what time should a uh, couple have the right to say when to get a divorce? You know, I grew up in South India, right? So part of it is I'm, I'm saying, you know what? 
even if you do want to get a divorce just because it's easy or just because you think it's tough, stay for the sake of the family. Stay for the sake of the community and tough it up for something bigger. Uh, on the other hand, in America, you might have a, a system that, that honors and individualizes, you know, for the individual and freedom. Mm. And to say that, you know what, hey, we, we leverage it more on this side, that the individual and their choices, hey, it's my choice, that's more important. So, and I think my faith and our faith, whether we're secular humanists or Jewish or Christian or whatever, is certainly going to play a role into how I view how to value divorce and where to play the line. So, um, I think it, it might be wise to try to keep it separate in some sense, but, uh, but I think it's too mixed. Um, I have no idea whether that answered your question or not, but uh, <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you. Okay, good. <laughs> I have no idea, no idea how to answer that, but I like your answer, okay. even though it had nothing to do with the question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Morty. It was a good answer, though. It's the wrong question you asked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, the rules of um, discussion and equal respect for everyone, no matter um, how many adherents they are for it, uh, respect for non-believers and so on and so forth, just mandates mm -hmm. uh, yeah. certain civilization and also a consciousness of uh, the right of everyone else that is equal to yours um, to be respected, okay. uh, and that just impedes and prohibits fanaticism and so on in discussion. So that would be my answer. It's, it's good if it doesn't get more. Uh, there were three questions that came in specifically for each of the three of you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Professor uh, Mueller. Um, what are your thoughts on the David Foster Waller, uh, Wallace quote uh, that Satyan shared, do you feel like you worship anything in life? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My dog. Yeah. My dog. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, for President Shapiro, if you could change the university to make it more open to religion, I guess there's an assumption there, but if you could do that, what would you do? You know, I... I, I I kind of like the way we are, you know, to hear the discussion at our table that, you know, some people of faith feel really hesitant to bring in anything other than, you know, we, not just in a religion class, but I think the context was in a history class, I think. And, and you know, does it bother me? I mean, I understand faculty run their classes, they do the best jobs they can. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, listening to you, I, I don't know how comfortable you know, someone would be if 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 a uh, you know, religious Christian got up and said, "No, this is my," you know, you know, if it's not a religion class, it could interfere with learning history. So I'm usually I, I just try to uh, I hope and, and and work towards the thing that no one is uh, you know adversely affected by his or her faith in any class. But you know, challenge as I think more about it, challenging people's belief is a way in many cases to build it and reaffirm it. And, you know, so I, as long as there's not extraordinary hostility in the class, in religion department or any other department, then I think that's fine. But I think it's really, we need a responsibility, I feel a responsibility, to make sure that these faith-based um, groups can really thrive, which is why I spend, you know, when I'm invited to the Muslim group or the Catholic group or Protestant, whatever group it is, and obviously Jewish, you know, I, I, I'm always ready to go and always ready to support. And, just as the president's office was one of the funders for this, I'm sure, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a real sucker for any faith-based thing. You know, I'm a sucker for any great idea that our wonderful students have, but particularly if it relates to faith. And it doesn't have to be interfaith, which again, as I said in the beginning, yeah. I'm a little bit more skeptical about it. You know, mm -hmm. I think in, there are so many people who want to engage in interfaith dialogue who know next to nothing about their own faith. And it's an easy thing for them. And I sit at these things and I hear, Jewish students defending this or that, and they don't know anything about Judaism. <laughs> and I'm sure you would say the yeah. same about Christians or secular who may, <laughs> what, you, you know, what standing do you have? And I, I just think that when you do interfaith dialogue, you have a responsibility to know something about your own faith <laughs> first before you mislead everybody else about it. So. Yeah. So, yeah. 
uh, to Professor Devados. What examples do you have of things science can't explain, and how do you know science won't be able to explain them one day? Oh, gosh. Good question. That's a great question. Um, Glad that was for you and not me. Yeah, that's... <laughs> he just have time. So to me, I think these go back to ideas of miracles, yes, right? Of and uh, okay. these are singularities that happened, that continue to happen as example of parting the Red Sea or the burning of, the, uh, of, this, of this bush. And, uh, and these numerous things you see in scripture, I've seen things happen in my own eyes that people just healed in front of me. Uh, and you can say, well, you know, maybe there's a reason for this. Maybe there's, there's a crystal that if you hold it at the right angle, boom, water just separates. And, uh, and you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not going to say any of this is 100%. It's all a probability game, right? So to me, I say the thing that makes the most probable sense is that there was a God who did this, for there's a sense of consistency in what I see. And, uh, and is it possible that something else would be, would be there, that one day down the line we'd find it? Sure, but... To me, the probability makes more sense to believe in a God who did this than some magical science thing that I'm hoping to, hoping and praying for would explain those things. Yo, can I add one thing? Yes. I mean, who created the crystal? God. So I, I, I really don't feel, you know, I, I don't feel like when scientists explain something that looked like a miracle that it isn't a miracle anymore when you understand DNA and understand this. I'm, you know, I, th that doesn't shake my faith at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if the winds happen to come and that's when the Red Sea opened or not. I mean, who created the wind? That's not <laughs> falsifiable, <laughs> I, but you know, that's, that's just a, my faith. I, 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 just I have only one cautionary okay, qu please. question. I, I figured you would. I don't yeah. want to get in trouble. I mean, you're sure, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not the president here. I'm just a professor of economics. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, do you think that everybody who can be seriously appreciated as leading a fulfilled life has to ask these questions? No. No. I, so I, I don't. I, I don't. I got in trouble once my first year when I gave a, a, a talk, and it was actually at Shield for Catholics, yeah. and somebody asked me, how do you feel about people who don't have faith? And I, and I said that I, I feel sorry for them, but this is in a sense, because when things go bad in my life, I fall back on my faith. And when things go well, I, I fall back on my faith. And you know, I, I don't think I'm any better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. but I, and, and I don't think it's a crutch you know, for me. But I, but I think that I, couldn't, I, don't, I wouldn't have the strength to lead my life without a belief in God. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but maybe it's my weakness. But I, I, you know, so that's what I feel. I don't feel sorry in that I feel superior. And that's what the mm -hmm. Daily Northwestern said. Presidents feel sorry for people who don't believe in God. That was literally <laughs> front page. <laughs> Almost as big as Dunkin' Donuts comes to Norris. You know, that's what, so, and, and, and a group of secular humanists had me there. And they, they, you know, they had me the next week. And I came. I love to talk about these things. And I said, they said, you didn't say that. I said, no, I did say that, but let me explain to you. And, and I feel like, you know, I don't feel superior about it, but I really do think that when you really believe in your faith, you know, it gives you a comfort uh, that I, I can't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So let me answer your question, uh, which is that when you say a fulfilled life, that's a very dangerous, uh, I don't know what that means, a fulfilled life, but I would say that, uh, I would say that the Christian faith, or the Geo-Christian faith in some sense, is the true reality. In the sense, it's, it's almost like believing in a lot of physics, but not maybe the gravity part. And or a lot of physics, but not electromagnetism or something. And you say, hey, you know what? I think if you believe this whole thing, you'll lead a richer life because you see the truth for what it is. And I think most faiths would make the same claim. If you, if you believe in the J Jewish faith, or if you believe in the faith of Islam, that that is, that is what we think real is. And, uh, and your life will be more fulfilled. It'll be what it was meant to be. You'll understand how reality is. So, Mori and I will be in hell. No, I'm not, hell isn't the right word, right? And that's not what I mean at all. Oh, I just mean... in trouble. No, I just... No, 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 listen to me. I just mean living the life now. Forget the afterlife. I mean now. It's, you'll have a richer life and in, in a certain perspective. And, um, but that doesn't mean you can't have a good life. You can't have a great life. It just means that I think you'll have a better life. That's what, that's what faith says, right? That's, that's why we put our chips in our bucket to say that. So you would just say, yes, I have to ask these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, are up against 10 o'clock, and uh, I've been told that's the cutoff time. So 
Uh, what I'd like to do is take just the last few minutes that we have and give each of you uh, an opportunity to make some final remarks. Uh, if you have a particular thought uh, that you want to leave the audience with uh, this evening, uh, I think that um, maybe President Shapiro will oh, give you the right of first refusal. Okay, I refuse. <laughs> you I, you know, I, I really felt like I said what I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not an expert. I'm, I am just more of an amateur than anybody here, I think, on this, on this stage. But, um, I mean, I said what my faith means to me. But I, I really was serious when I, I don't feel like you need to have faith, you know, to be fulfilled or be as good as me, as no. good as I. You might have other things that work for you, and I was going to say, yeah. God bless you, yeah. but you'll probably hit me if I say that. No. And, uh, not but I, I literally, okay, I literally uh, mean God bless you. Whatever works for you. I, I know what works for me, and mm. I'm not into proselytizing or trying to be, I, I, just, I, I just feel an obligation, you know, I, certainly as a president, but I, just as a person to, to share my feelings. And some of them find them interesting, some of them find them stupid, you know, but for me, it works. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. That's cool. Professor Mueller? Um, I feel the same way as what it just expressed. I think I've uh, had you hear my voice enough. Um, I've maybe just uh, an appeal to uh, one of the unconditional arts, <laughs> just uh, equal respect mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. is enormously important uh, for all purposes of uh, social life. And I think Absolutely. that's one of the most, and there's a part an emotional part to equal respect that, um, that, that is maybe something where I can talk a little bit about my personal attitude towards an unconditional art, which is uh, that I feel delicacy should be part of it. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I never would mm -hmm. um, offend you mm -hmm. uh, if I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. I uh, would ne never purposely offend you by rejecting your blessing. Uh, mm. because I know what it means to you, mm. and mm -hmm. uh, who mm -hmm. am I to uh, mm -hmm. take that fulfillment in your life out of your hands yeah. just because uh, I can upset, uh, upset you. That would be, mm. like, uh, nasty. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Uh, Give the I, final there, word to you. Thank you. Uh, there's just, I just want to share this little story which I really love, and I, just a sense of encouragement. Uh, it's a story about Karl Barth. He's, um, he's one of the greatest um, theologians of the last century. And, and this one time, Karl, you know, he spent all of his life pouring into scripture and studying and understanding it. And he was coming out of church service one day, and this, ama this famous astronomer comes to him and he said, Professor Barth, isn't it true that all of the Christian faith and all of religion basically boils down to one phrase? And uh, Karl Barth is kind of taken back. I mean, everything I've been thinking about all my life and these other religions and faiths I've struggled with, what is this one phrase, my friend, that all of this comes down to? He goes, well, do good unto others as you would have them do good unto you. Isn't that just all of religion in a nutshell? I mean, isn't that just the point? And Karlbaugh thought about this a little bit, and, and he said, my friend, he turned to the astronomer and he said, well, isn't it true that all of astronomy also boils down to this phrase? And, uh, and he goes, there's a phrase that, that captures space and time, the curvature, and black holes, and quantum mechanics, and all these beautiful things. What is this phrase? And he goes, isn't it just twinkle, twinkle, little star? How I wonder what you <laughs> And uh, you can see Karl Barth has a great wit about him. But, but the point is, is that when we're here talking about these deep ideas that brilliant men and women for thousands of years have struggled with, it's kind of easy to throw these Twitter tidbits out there and say, you know what, that's all the Jewish faith means. That's all the Christian faith means. Or that's all even secular humanism means. I encourage you, you know, as is in this great university, take time and learn what these other things mean. You know, pursue it, get messy, get dirty, and find out what this rich history is all about. That's my encouragement. Well, with that, I'd like to thank all three of you gentlemen for participating in this Veritas Forum. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.